Hello, my name is Andrei Soares. I'm an oncologist in São Paulo from Centro Policy de Oncology, Hospital Albert Einstein, and chair to uh, from Arcoli GU. Uh, we are here with Dr. Chris Sweeney from Donald Faber Cancer Institute, a medical oncologist from Donald Faber, and Dr. Eric Strabasson from Nobi uh, Salvador Bahia. Uh, hello, guys. Hello. hello. So, Chris. What you can say for us about the, the, the treatment and the, the news from the treatment of patients with metastatic prostate cancer as castration sensitive patients? I think what we can clearly say now is that we know patients can have a good prognosis with hormonal therapy alone and patients can have a poor prognosis with hormonal therapy alone. By that I mean testosterone suppression as the form of hormonal therapy with an agent like lupulide or cazarolin. We've been doing that for many years, and we've been treating patients when they were, once they were resistant with drugs like docetaxel and abiraterone now for many years. And what we've learned is that if we bring up docetaxel for when they start the hormonal therapy, or when we bring abiraterone up front when we start the hormonal therapy, patients live longer and have a better quality of life if they get the agents together up front. So it's telling us our drugs are more effective. And when we look at the patients who benefit the most, it's clear that it's the patients who have the poorer survival. With, and it looks like the, those are patients who have more, multiple bony metastases, liver metastases, who present with cancer for the first time, not the patient who relapses years after having had a prostatectomy with a rising PSA and E2, C2 bony metastases. So, I think that's something we should be offering our patients, especially those who have a high burden of metastatic disease, either ADT and tocotaxel and ADT or abiraterone. Now, the all-important question is which one? So, very cool. Uh, yes. we, saw since, we saw since 2014 with the data of Charted uh, adding those taxa to ADT. And this year we saw at ASCO the data from Latitude adding abiraterone to ADT. But uh, we're seeing that so many uh, oncologists are moving to prescribe more ABI with ADT than those taxo and ADT. You think that it's, it's, it's a, a, a possibility to, to change our practice in Brazil? Uh, why we have to change? Because one data, the, the, don't say that the another data is it's, uh, weak data. So what do you think about this? Yeah, I, I think both data are, are good data and they present with survival benefit. Uh, but the problem is which one to choose, I guess. In my opinion, if the patient has some features like neuroendocrine tumor, uh, low PSA, uh, high volume disease, visceral metastasis, I tend to prescribe, to recommend taxotere with ADT. And if the patient is not, probably uh, abiraterona is good as well. But the, the, the other problem is the price. The price, I guess, is the key. Because I guess abiraterona is much more uh, expensive. What's your opinion about this? I think it's the easier proposition is to run for abiraterona. It's, it's a pill, patients are much more comfortable with it, and chemotherapy is an emotional undertaking for patients because it is uh, cancer and you, getting chemotherapy and it has side effects and hair loss and hair loss and, and the quality of life the fatigue and the risk of neutropenic fever so it's harder to offer proposed those attacks but I think it still has lots of benefits and what well, I think arguments that I made in the lecture today for why one would consider dose taxol um, there's clearly the reason where you think they may be a, more of a hormone independent cancer, like the neuroendocrine, if they had lots of visceral metastases and things that you said. But the other thing is, I, the more therapies you can get into a patient, the more likely they're going to live longer and get the benefit from each agent. And so I think the answer is, it's worth considering it because it's, this is probably the time the patient is going to be the fittest to be able to get docetaxel. And you can give them six cycles, stop, and they just be on hormonal therapy alone. And then you can bring in the other agent without the long-term side effects of being on long-term abiraterone and prednisone. So it's the unfashionable answer is what I'm saying. But I think there are merits to considering docetaxel 
And if a person cannot afford it, or their insurance won't cover it, or they have pre um, diabetes, I do not think anything is lost at all if you start with docetaxel. Uh, talking about quality of life and toxicity, I think that we have to clear some facts because I think that's that's very important. When you when you when you see the patients of high risk patients from Chartered, uh, we know that the quality of life is is improved with those taxi. and we see the same data with Abraterol. Uh, and we when we talk about the toxicity, we know that the the grade of toxicity. It's, it's the number of the patients who present with toxicity are the same. Yeah. It's almost 50% grade 3 and 4. Uh, uh, but but the, to the toxicity profile are different. And this is, seems for the patient and for the doctor that abraterone is easier than, than the chemotherapy. Maybe it's easier because the, 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 the toxicity, uh, hematolo hematological toxicity. But the number of the patients who present with toxicity are equal. Yeah. But what, what do you think about the kind of yeah they, they're tr absolutely true it's the side effects of abiraterone are more insidious they take longer to come on they are oftentimes a laboratory value but the uh, but can cause a significant complication such as a low potassium which can sometimes lead to cardiac arrhythmias i've had some atrial patients with have atrial fibrillation from that and that's a serious side effect the fluid retention i've had a patient develop serious fluid retention um, after being on it for a short period of time. So it's more subtle and um, it is like um, Ulysses um, and the sirens are calling him into the, crashing into the shores. You think it's going to be easy, but there are things that can happen that make it what seems an easy proposition not always, especially in the long term. Chris, if one patient use use uh, charted, and after one year, uh, the disease progresses, would you would challenge this patient with taxotere, or would you change to abiraterone in this case? I tend to change to abiraterone for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if they've had a good response for 12 months or so with a suppressed PSA, and that's would tell me that they're pretty androgen dependent. Um, and so they're testosterone independent, but androgen dependent now, I suspect, mm -hmm. by the nature of that res um, response to the prior monotherapy. And I think when we have an option to use sequential non um, cross reacting drugs, different mechanisms of action, reaching for that rather than reaching back to the dose of taxi mm -hmm. is more profitable for patients. Chris, what do you say about the combo? or the sequential treatment, but the patient who received like six cycles of those tax cell and then starts immediately after the, the chemo with abiraterone. What, what do you think this is strategy? How do you manage with your patients? Yeah, so I, I, I re I'm really hopeful that when we can combine the studies from Enzymet and PEACE1, which approved patients to ADT plus or minus AVI or Enzo, and patients were stratified by dose of taxi use. That we'll have a study of 500 patients, if we combine the data, who got ADT dosi and ADT dosi or Avienza in combination, so a doublet versus a triplet. And but hopefully by this time next year, we'll have the data, hopefully. And we see a striking benefit, like we saw with Chartered and Latitude and Stampede. Um, so I think there's, it's possible that we will see a striking benefit. I'm hopeful we will, because it'll be another great advance for our patients. Whether we should be doing it now, it's debatable. But if you think a patient needs all the therapies up front because they've got, they're really sick and their PSA hasn't gone down far enough after these six cycles of docetaxel, I think it's very reasonable. You can't stand on a podium and say it should be done. And by the same token, I don't think you can stand on a podium and fault people for doing it if you think in your clinical intuition the patient would benefit from it. Well, what do you think about the future? Uh, how, how we can choose patients, right patient for right treatment? Which, which patient, which treatment? So. Yeah, no, it's a, an, a really important area of research. 
What I can say right now is there are lots of biomarkers being developed, but we need to do really good thorough biomarker research. And we are getting samples from the chartered study and working with the uh, Stampede team as well, where we'll look for gene protein, genal protein markers from those who got ADT alone and see if we can see a poor prognosis signature from ADT alone and see if they are patients who then, so prognostic marker here, are they patients who got the benefit from adding docetaxel, so a predictive marker. And so we're, I don't know if you know the decipher assay from Genome DX. Yep. So uh, we're working with uh, Genome DX to look at the million uh, RNA transcript AFI array so we can look at various proteins. Um, uh, sorry, various genes and study different biologies. We've stained um, 300 of the samples from the trust biopsies for P10 loss, and we'll have hopefully that data um, in about a, or possibly within the next few months. So they've all been stained, we've got the clinical data, the statisticians are going to analyze that. So it could be those who benefit the most have low P10, they have a poor prognosis with ADT but they get the benefit from ABT and docetaxel is our research plan, which would be proper um, biomarker work, and then we will see if we can replicate that with data from the Stampede samples. In, in your practice, do you, do you start at uh, docetaxel, docetaxel and ADT together, or do you prefer to start it with ADT and one or two months after the chemo? Yeah, I it's a really good question. Clearly, there's no good data. When I see these patients now, it's actually become a very complicated conversation. And so what I say is, let's first start with the hormonal therapy. And we don't have to rush to start the chemotherapy, but we should do it in about a month, is what I say. And, and I think patients tolerate it better if their testosterone is being suppressed. Yes. Um, you as medical oncologists in Brazil treat other cancers other than prostate, um, other diseases. And if you, my impression when I treated lung cancer or head and neck cancer with docetaxel, it was much more toxic. Whereas it, there's evidence that the docetaxel is cleared faster in patients who are castrate, and therefore they may actually tolerate it because of that. So I think it's better tolerated. It helps patients get emotionally prepared for it. Um, get their life structure sorted so they can come in for the chemotherapy. So I, I delay it a month on average for those reasons. And, and, there, and there's a, there are clinical data showing this, this different clearance of, of those taxel and, and testosterone levels. And, and if you compare the, the, the toxicity profile from G215 yep. and Chartered and, and Sandes uh, with relationship of, of neutropenia, uh, we saw that the, the median time to start the, the, the Stuxel at G215 is 15 days and, and the chart is 1.1 month and yeah. maybe this has some relationship I between so, the, yeah. the neutropenia and this kind of toxicity. Yeah, but it's, you're absolutely right. It's, it, is, it is quite an interesting observation that they had quite more a number of neutropenic fever um, early on and they actually mandated GCSF support um, whereas we didn't see any of that, any toxicity to that degree. So, yeah, so there's a lot of circumstantial evidence to suggest delaying it four to six weeks is preferable. Very cool, Chris. Thank you very much. Thank you all to Thank see you us. Andre. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Next time, please. Thank you.